Hello, everyone. My name is Jim St. Pierre. I'm one of um, the, this year's main humanities teacher leader fellows, along with Dory Tripp. She's a humanities teacher leader fellow, but I'll be presenting today's webinar on inclusion. And um, I'm sure that all of us are aware of inclusion and we try to work it into the classroom as, as much as we can. But um, I'd like to deal today with some of the concepts that might be new or to reinforce some of the concepts that we already are familiar with, and maybe give you a few resources that you can use uh, in your own practices. So first, let me um, share my screen. Let me start at the beginning here. Sorry about that. I was just reviewing it before. Okay, so these are techniques for educational inclusion um, and, excuse me, um, we're gonna be dealing with four major areas, right? The benefits and the reasons that we wanna practice and, and uh, foster inclusion in our classrooms. We'll go to creating an inclusive space. So that's actually the physical space that we teach in. And then we deal with the, um, so the metaphorical space, the language that we use and the inclusive practices that we can bring. And uh, some of these I'm sure are reviews and some of you probably have more to offer than I do. And I encourage you to, um, to send us your ideas either through the emails that will show at the end or through the humanities website at the Department of Education. But first the benefits of inclusion in the classroom. Um, so I've listed this, of course, many, many benefits. I've listed some of the more um, the, the more powerful ones. And it provides equal learning opportunities for everyone. Everyone has access to the structures, the techniques, the resources that can assist their, assist their learning. I think this is one of the reasons special education has become such an integral part of our schools is because, um, you know, they, they're able to create equal learning opportunities for all students that might not have the ability to access them otherwise. Um, and maybe uh, we as teachers can bring more practices and more ways of creating inclusion in our classroom um, that can help out with this, with other students that can't access that. Um, and so inclusion benefits all students, not just the ones who might have trouble, you know, to, uh, accessing the learning in the classroom. Studies suggest students gain empathy and respect for diverse abilities, right? They gain tolerance and acceptance. Um, students learn to work together, promote acceptance and appreciation for differences. Um, I am very proud. At one point, my son, we were given a note by his teacher how there was a student that was um, struggling uh, to access the lessons and the learning, and, and nobody wanted to work with him. But my son worked with him and was very patient and helped him, you know, to, um, you know, to become engaged in the content. And um, it was a formative experience for him. And he actually wrote about it on his college essay. And so for him, it was a huge advantage being able to be a part of that inclusion. So uh, promotes conversations of equality, membership, community, differences. It combats bullying, right? Because everyone is working together. They start to look out for each other. Um, and then, of course, it models appropriate behavior. They see how to behave in the classroom and certain, certain social settings. And they learn what's appropriate and what's not appropriate and how to treat other people who are different. Um, and the first, um, I don't necessarily think it's the easiest, but one of the first things we can do to address inclusion is just from the design of our classrooms, right? Every classroom is different. Every lesson has its own needs. And so below are several questions every educator needs to ask when addressing both, what are the, what's the lessons needs and what are the students needs? So we wanna ask, does the physical layout of the class match the intended learning activities? Does everyone have equal access to the resources? Can everyone be heard? Does the instructor have e access to all the students? Can we, um, are we able to interact with all the students in the same way because um, of the layout of the room? And it, or at least in, the, in, in a constructive way, is the space organized enough for this activity? And so I've sort of uh, talked, uh, and I have some images to follow in this, but um, there's a couple um, that I want you to be, that I'd like to present. And one is uh, I have a colleague where I work who teaches music and uh, he's very talented. And he 
organizes his classes around large corridors that he can then roam around the room and listen closely as students play. And, and he, he's able to engage students individually because there's not a huge space between him or any individual student. So he can reach over and talk to one who's not playing the right note or who's having trouble with their instrument. And so there's quick and precise interactions that that, that, that layout allows for him in the space. Um, that's in contrast to my biology classroom, which is a typical layout uh, with tables and a lab area off to the side. And the lab area, unfortunately, takes up about half of the class. And it's not a, a functional layout, right? It's, it's, it, wasn't, it was poorly arranged when they built the room. And so the question is, how can we work the space more inclusively? And uh, so I and my roommate decided, uh, my classroom roommate, uh, she, I share a class with other teachers, um, decided to link the tables together in order to create more space for the lab work. And, um, and that way, um, you know, we're able to uh, go up and down the rows and see the students and still participate and still create um, lab work. It's not a perfect classroom, but it's better than it was. But that came from a discussion about how can we create a better, better flow in the space so we have more contact and, and, and more um, that students have more accessibility to the resources in the classroom. I have images of my wife's class. She's a kindergarten classroom. She's been teaching for over 20 years and hers is designed around a central meeting area where all activities originate. She has desks spread around the room that work for independent work, work well for independent work and where each student can store their individual materials. And that's a holdover actually from COVID. She always had tables before, but she found the desks made for more individual space um, while also having a group space and they can combine desks as well if they need to sort of as an interpretive space if they want to work in groups. And so here's a picture of her classroom and here on the left is her central area and she often has a rug there. Yeah, she, you can see it there um, right in front of the desks um, and the students can sit on the letter. And that's another way she teaches the alphabet. What letter are you sitting on? What sound does it make? Um, so that's where she begins her day and she begins most activities from there. <clears throat> the desks are arranged in a circle around the room and each has their own, their own content and their own material there. And she also has um, shelves with um, materials that the students are all able to reach and access. They can't reach the top ones, thank goodness, because um, it's a lot up there. But um, all of those totes are available for each student. And she actually has another one with all of their names on them where they can reach and grab their own stuff out of the desk as well. So a lot of accessibility in this arrangement comes from a lot of inclusion. Um, and so here's some questions to ask when you're creating an inclusive space. Does the space contribute to the learners feeling safe and respected? Um, and so the experts uh, suggest that you try sitting in different spaces to envision how students might feel. Um, and actually Pinterest has a lot of resources for design ideas. I, do I did that in the science classroom and we actually, because of that, we found that some didn't have a um, very good view of the screen that we used to present some of um, some of the materials and some of the, you know, the labs, the lessons that we're presenting. So we moved it to another side of the room where everybody has a very good view of it. Um, how difficult is it for students to find and use materials? Should materials be located in multiple stations? Should materials be provided for separately for each student? And actually in the science room, that's another thing that uh, my class room partner and I did was we cleared out some um, cabinets that were that had glass doors which uh, students can see through and we put in the materials in there they didn't used to be in there we put in the materials that they use most often so they can actually see where they go and they have quick access to them as well and of course I just spoke about how uh, can they can they see everything that they need is everything visible and accessible so these are all things that you have to think about when, when designing or at least organizing a classroom. Now, we obviously don't have much say in the overall design, but we can still organize what's in it in different ways. Uh, this is a, one of the, I teach English as well as science, and this is a classroom that I primarily teach in. It's a beautiful big space. It was actually the former library in my school, but um, when it was renovated, we asked that we have um, lots of tables here that then can be moved around in different ways. And there isn't a lot, uh, there's content on the sides this, that, that students can bring, but there's a lot of space here for them to be able to manipulate the tables and the chairs and do group work or projects or push them to the side if we have a presentation that we need to work on. Uh, so it's what has often become sort of 
the go-to design for a classroom is an interpretive space. Uh, some inclusive language is an important part of how we create a sense of inclusion in our classroom. So I'm still working on this because I'm an old school teacher and I've realized now in the past few years that a lot of what, um, a lot of the language that I thought was okay, you know, actually has a certain bias or a certain offensiveness to it. So I refer to, okay, I might previously say, okay, gang or okay, boys or um, and anything that sort of had a gender specific reference was, is, is you know, is not inclusive. I'm ex by using that language, I'm excluding certain students who don't see themselves that way. And some students aren't sensitive to it, others are. But um, I mean, trying to include everybody, I got to use language. Uh, I think it's important to use language that doesn't leave anyone out. Because um, students should understand, as should we, that words matter. Everything we say to our students matters. Making sure our words don't exclude anyone is the responsibility of every teacher. And there's some sources that can help with this, right? First is this movement called Disabled Label. Um, this is where you put the person before the language, right? So the per person first language puts the child before the disability. So instead of saying a dyslexic child, you'd say a child with dyslexia. Instead of saying um, um, a slave, you'd say an enslaved man or an enslaved woman or an enslaved human being. Um, not that that's a disability, right? Um, but that, that becomes the, the way if you want to think about language and inclusion, you always put the individual, the person, the human being first, and then whatever um, label, if, you, if it were, if, if you need to assign a label afterwards. Um, Atlantic Black Box is an organization out of Portland that, uh, I think it's out of Portland, Maine, that seeks to teach the truth about the history of New England's relationship with slavery. Uh, and believe it or not, even though we don't have any slaves here, a lot of the fortunes of early families were on the backs of slaves um, who produced products that were shipped to Maine. People made a lot of them. Their resources include the proper ways to refer to enslaved people and how to discuss difficult issues regarding the practice of slavery and their exploitation. So if we go to that site, Um, the Atlantic Black Box. Um, you're going to see, um, let me give you a definition here. The black box is anything that has mysterious or unknown internal mechanisms, a crashworthy device for recording hard data, and unadorned experimental performance space. That's what they organization <clears throat> And then there's resources here, um, resources for educators. And one of them is terminology. If we click on that, they give you the language to consider. Language to consider avoiding as a slave master, right? You want to have, um, you know, uh, an enslaver rather than somebody who puts the slaves first. We explain what that person, that person's role was the slave, right? As the enslaver. Master transmit the aspirations and values of enslaving class without naming the practices they engaged, right? So we want to be aware of how powerful language is, right? Um, so they say principles to consider avoid using runaway slaves. Alternatives would be fugitives from slavery, self-liberated individuals, or self-emancipated individuals, right? Um, and, uh, and, and here the, the word enslaved, right? We want to talk about people um, as uh, who they are, and, and we don't want to talk about them as, well, using enslaved as an adjective rather than slave as a noun disaggregates the condition of being enslaved with the status of being a slave. People weren't slaves. They were enslaved, right? It's not a, it's not something people choose to do. Um, so a lot of their language comes to um, respecting the, the human being rather than what role they've been assigned to in life. Um, and there's um, the American Psychological Association contributes one of the most highly regarded adopted uh, contributes one of the most highly regarded and adopted books on writing conventions, which contains a chapter on inclusive language. The two biggest um, conventions for writing and, and formatting are uh, MLA, Modern Language Association, and the um, APA, the American Psychological Association, at least in the Northeast. And, um, and so here they have uh, a really long comprehensive list, list about inclusive language and writing, right? Um, and uh, how to think about language and 
and just how to be respectful as you write. Uh, podcasts as well are great ways to start to understand diversity and equity and language that's used and people's point of views. Excuse me, the diversity gap and the inclusion spot podcast are great. And I think that the diversity gap might actually, one of these has um, individuals who, uh, the host brings on individuals who are uh, from a diverse voices and see that one or the inclusion school pod, podcast i think it's the diversity gap oh no this one the inclusion school pod, podcast they bring in guests and they talk about how to create a sense of inclusion um, but the diversity gap brings in guests people who have suffered from or who are often excluded uh, in different ways from cultures or classrooms or society. And so they talk about how they overcome that and, and how they give advice for how people, we can contribute to more inclusive practices just in our lives. Uh, and you, in fact, may know of some, and I encourage you to send them to us at uh, the Humanities website or to me or Dory. Uh, emails are at the end. Um, and here's some uh, fairly basic or uh, inclusive practices that some of you, I'm sure, already Age. And one of the most powerful for me as a teacher was the idea of universal design. And this was an architectural philosophy where you design buildings that are accessible to everybody all the time and not just for a few people some of the time. Um, and so everybody can use the same space, whether you're handicapped or not. And that creates a great sense of inclusion because everybody, um, everybody's, everybody's a part of the, the structure. Um, and, and I adopted this has become sort of a Phyllis, oh, and it's, I'm sorry, to get back to the physical design, this is when, when we renovated our school, the, um, uh, the architects at the behest of, um, you know, the people in, in charge, the administrators were, wanted the bathrooms not to be um, gender specific. They wanted to make sure they were inclusive for everybody to use, um, regardless of your gender of choice. And uh, so that we had two bathrooms, one for men, one for women, and one for boys, one for girls. And they replaced them with three, um, three gender um, neutral bathrooms that uh, everybody can make access, uh, everybody can access equally. <clears throat> oh, I just want to get back to this idea of universal design. For me, it was a powerful lesson that I learned as a teacher and that I don't just need to make the same mater the materials accessible for the students who were struggling, right? Who needed that extra um, that extra focus or the extra directions or whatever in order to access. If I made that for everybody, um, then everybody benefited from it. And, um, and I found that it was much easier to teach the content when everybody had all of the, when everybody had all of the materials that everybody needed, right? Not just to, I wouldn't just lecture, right? I would, I would make, I would take the notes. I'd give the notes to everybody. I would, I would uh, present images to everybody. It would be uh, sort of a universal approach to teaching that benefited not just the students that, that were required to have that, well, for whatever reason, to, in order to be included, but, um, you know, even, even the students that weren't designated were able to benefit from it. All right. There's, uh, and when you're teaching, of course, there's multiple means of representation of the material, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, verbal. So if you speak it, you give them activity, uh, you know, you uh, might have music or something, you, you know, of course, something visual as well. Multiple means of expression. You might have written, oral, physical, analog, technical, multiple means of engagement. It might be a prose and graphic novel, verse, podcast, videos, private and partner reading, storytelling, fiction, nonfiction. So for my wife, and um, uh, she uses a uh, big advocate of Lucy Calkins, uh, who is a reading a proponent of certain ways of reading and writing. And part of that is sharing literature. So you, you um, students will sit together and they love this in her classroom. She teaches kindergartners and they will read to each other. That way they, uh, you know, they take pride in their work. Uh, people that aren't able to access it have somebody they can work with to access information. 
and they absolutely uh, have a different way of engaging with their content. Um, for, for me, as an English teacher, um, uh, I, I, I often try to consider alternatives to some difficult text. This year we read Frankenstein in the class and some students just weren't getting the material. They just weren't able to make it through it. So I recommended and, and made available to them the graphic novel version. It doesn't cover all of the content of the prose, but it still has uh, most of it. And they're able to participate in the discussions and the themes and, um, and they were able, able to be in, engaged in the classroom and they're able to use it as a reference when they did their writing. So um, they got a lot out of that, uh, you, you know, more, far more than they might have had they just had the book and they didn't, and they weren't able to get through it for whatever challenges or, or reasons they had. So it was another way of, of including them in the, in the class, bringing in a comic. And so uh, realizing the power of comics and that they, they uh, you know, this very visual generation. Uh, I have a whole library here of comic books that students can use, um, you know, as, to supplement their reading, or uh, sometimes there's a lot of adaptations like we had of Frankenstein. Uh, and it, everybody's available, you know, the books are there for anybody to sign out and to read at any time they want to see the sign out on the top right of the shelf here. And um, it also gets people that aren't that are reticent readers that don't like to read it, get them hooked and can include them and the, the wonders of reading in a new way. Um, and if they never move on from comics, that's fine. The idea is that they're able to engage in this content um, in a meaningful way for them. I also have a sticker on the door, a lot of my colleagues as well, which is to be an ally so the students know it's a safe space and that they're not excluded from anything. Um, I asked my wife how she does this with her elementary students, and she was explaining at her elementary school that they make classroom promises at the beginning, and those promises are shared with their family, the promises of being good citizens, of being kind, of being respectful. Um, and those are, are used throughout the school. So all the classes do this, and then they share the entire school, um, makes promises, and they bring everything together. So the school is working, working towards an inclusive vision that everybody can take advantage of. Right. Um, so that's all the inclusion material that we have for now. If you have any questions or if you want to contribute in anything, please, please contact us. My email is here, james.saint.pierre at maine.gov and of course, story.trip at maine.gov. You can also go to our humanities website, which is linked here. And so on the website, I will link um, both this this video, uh, this recording, and I will, um, I'll put on the presentation as well so that you can go through and click on the resources if, you have, if there's any that you're really interested in. So thank you for interest, uh, for, for attending, for being interested in the content, and I wish you a lot of inclusion in your classrooms, and I look forward to seeing you at the next professional development webinar we host. <laughs>